and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming cyberpunk adventure known as Sinless. The one and only Courtney, don't call him Bruce, Campbell. How are you doing today, man? I'm, I'm good, thank you for having me in the temple. Thank you for coming on. So, tradition dictates that I, I start with the humble beginnings, as I do with every newcomer. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, I was... Um... I would be taken with my father over to the houses where he would play D&D &D in 1978. And so it was always an activity they were doing, and we would watch movies and play Dungeon, the board game. And uh, soon after that, by the time I was seven or eight, I was running a D&D &D game. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was on the Usenet forums. In the late 80s and 90s, uh, played a lot of second edition and vampire. Um, and I, I haven't thought about this or prepared it, so I apologize for all the pauses and ums I'm literally having to remember. And, and then um, uh, I, you know, uh, went to college and uh, spent some time, I, I worked in social work for about 20 years, and I was in Alaska for a little while. Mm -hmm. And while he was up there, Hackmaster came out, and I was just enamored with what uh, Kenzer and Jolly had done with the property. And it was kind of the genesis of the OSR. And I started, I moved back from Alaska in 2006, and I started blogging. Um, and that eventually led into writing supplements, eventually led into writing books, and now I'm a full-time tabletop RPG creator. Mm -hmm. So, given the, given the pre, given the presence of of um what's of the way Sinless presents itself, uh, how what was your first introduction to to um cyberpunk as a genre? So it would have to be about the time, 88, 89, becoming a teenager and a young adult. And you didn't want to play D&D &D anymore because that was kiddie stuff. And uh, girls would play games like Vampire and Shadowrun. And so that's what we did, is we played Vampire and Shadowrun. And I just remember being enamored of the fantasy in the cyberpunk. Like... Mm -hmm. I, I love I love the fantasy aesthetic so much and it did so much to bring it into a world where it raised all kinds of interesting questions. And it it was really one of my first introductions into game design, because I don't mm -hmm. know if you know this, but Shadowrun has some mechanical issues throughout the years. <laughs> so we Just a little. We had, yeah. We had to we had to make some adjustments and I just it's kind of one of those things I always loved, but now when you're trying to start a game, you're trying to convince somebody to try and, like, it's a complicated mm -hmm. And I play a lot of games, and I want to play games that I want to play. And so, you know, I was feeling frustrated by a lot of the stuff. It has a troubled history, genre. And oh, yeah. I realized that it's my job. I could I could do something to... to I, so I made it for me, right? Like, this is the cyberpunk fantasy RPG I want to play. And it just so happens that I can share it with people. So that's kind of what I'm doing. It, it's not a replacement for anything. It's actually very different from Shadowrun. Shadowrun is a traditional RPG. And and what I mean when I say that is that the, the referee, the storyteller, the PM, they have a story. And they make things happen in the game to kind of force that story and outcome. And as an adult, most of the games I play are, are sandboxing and player-driven and have emergent drama. Mm -hmm. And so that's what uh, Sinless is. It's, a, it's an homage to Shadowrun, certainly, 
but you alternate between a domain phase and an operation phase. And failure is considered an option, and you're concerned about the brand. Uh, although there are individual runners that, that players will control, and they'll have their personal and family dramas, just like in a trad RPG, there's no set outcome. It's mm -hmm. more play to find out what happens. And so um, it solved a, a number of problems for me that let me put cyberpunk gaming back into my weekly rotation. Yeah. And admittedly for, admittedly for me, I've had, I've had, uh, I've had a complicated relationship with Sh with Shadowrun myself. Um, in, per in particular, there's, there's always been, there's always been one aspect to that, that it has that, I, that, um, I never, I never felt justified itself as as much, and that is the adversarial relationship between technology and magic. Is there a is there a question there? Um, I think I think what I the I think one of, one of the questions that I that I'd, that I'd ask on that front is obviously. When it comes to when it comes to some of the things that you had issues with regarding Shadowrun, aside from the aside from the sto aside from the um, traditional RPG aspects, what what would you say were some of the big ones that you endeavored to address oh, with man. Sinless? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for asking. You. Bioessentialism. My father and my ex are both type one diabetic. It, 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 they don't think nobody. I don't know if people who were writing. Shadowrunner aware um, at the time, but when you tell somebody that implanting a cybernetic device lowers their humanity, it, it's a bad look, right? Like, like they have insulin pumps. Like they have, like it's not. So I wanted all that. Off. I, I did. I wanted like you don't. There's no mention. Like the first edition Shadowrunner books talks about hunting and fighting engines. It's none of that. I wanted to move away from all the bioessentialist stuff. I wanted to move away from all the the you know the messages or whatever. The future is terrible, right? They do they do mind wiping and brainwashing, but we're not tapping into. Uh, we got rid of like there's not there's two fantasy style options. You can have the green or the blighted. And they have a selection of abilities and drawbacks you can choose. And the green are more sort of uh, thematically what you were talking about um, earlier before the podcast started. Mm -hmm. The interview started uh, with the, the the pastoral green English type, right? Like some of the some of the green traits are like you know they can't cross rivers or they like red caps or they're fairies or spirits more towards that. And um, the blighted removes, I think, uh, any sort of overtones for, you know, it's 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 a it's not related to their essential character, right? It's something mm -hmm. that happens to them regardless of who they are or where they're from, and so um, it's not making any statements about anybody's value or worth. Like it, you want to give, like one of the big focuses of Sinless is the players are the agents that make the moral choices. Right. And so they're going to be put in situations that have bad options and they're going to choose what's best for them or try and come up with a new one that doesn't, you know, that, that um, is more palatable to their wishes or their desires. They're going to try and stop enormity because they're in a world that has a lot of enormity going mm -hmm. on. And that's one of the I'm just going to keep talking here because that's one of the key core pillars of Sinless is mm -hmm. the. Um, it's an anti anti dystopian game, right? Yeah. There are dystopian elements, and for those that don't know, that just means that you, you live in a shitty world, but you can take action to improve it and make it better. And that's the gameplay of Sinless, right? It, it's not dystopians aren't sustainable, and there's certainly dystopian elements in this in a cyberpunk medium. But I really wanted to explore the ability of the characters to get in there and change that to affect it, and so like. Um, it's less static than Shadowrun. There's no mm -hmm. meta plot. You're creating your own world, your own game. There's no sort of bioessentialism. There's no like uh, residual uh, 
like racist content. We're not, you know, like I, I don't mean to. It was the eighties. Like I read the Shadowrun books, but I don't think that the Shadowrun book about the Wendigo is particularly sensitive to say that word or the culture that it stems from, or you know, and that's an issue. And I wanted to avoid all those issues, so I did. Okay, mm. everything in the game is is fantastical and uh, technological and really entertaining uh, with a minimum of feeling icky about how it's implemented. The icky is in the bad guys you encounter in the game, right? Mm -hmm. does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Now, every game has their all roads lead to Rome, in my, in my opinion. There's always one... But putting a, putting aside some of the er, putting aside some of the early days when we, when it when there was still a lot of wargaming DNA, there's always there's always certain certain mechanics that is that is going to be the mechanic in that in that particular game, um, like in 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 something like in something like say World of Darkness, there's always those D, those that D10 pool of dice and you're aiming for hits instead of a, a sum in Legend of the Five Rings. It's roll and keep. Roll a certain amount. Keep it. Roll X amount. Keep Y amount. Tens explode. Um, what is the Rome and the all roads lead to Rome for um, sinless? The DNA is Shadowrun three and four. Mm -hmm. I and so I have this great advantage over. Um, Catalyst, and that I've seen them produce six editions of the D6 pool game, and I've played them. So, like, I know what the problems are, and so it's not, it's not either of those systems. Uh, it uses an attribute pool system, which I think might be closest to Torchbearer um, in the way that it handles attribute pools and skills, possibly. And uh, you have skills that limit the number of dice you can roll, and technology can extend them. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're rolling d sixes mm -hmm. to hit a static a static target number and yeah. count successes. Like that's very Shadowrun three forty mm -hmm. four e because it's the static number. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I am curious. One of the one of the other things that was. That that was throughout Shadowrun was glitches. I.e., if you f if you roll a certain number of one, roll a certain number of ones, something else might happen. Some uh -huh. some sort of complication. Uh -huh. Um, do you have an equivalent to that, or is that not something? We call it we call it a, an argle bargle foofara. The reason we call I know some people saw it and they were joking. Well, of course, it's a dig at Catalyst, right? They wrote gibberish in their sixth edition print book. The whole paragraph and 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 just gibberish, and so I'm I'm poking fun at them a little. The 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 gibberish started with Argo Bargo Fru for all. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm sure every Shadowrun player who sees that will get the joke. But yeah, if all your if all your pull dice ones are automatic failures, and if they all come up one, it's uh, an entertaining complication. I yeah. I uh, it's it does affect people who have smaller limits and roll smaller dice pools so if you're not as good at something you're more likely to get i'm going to call it an entertaining outcome mm -hmm. now one of the problems that i ended up having with with shadowrun as it developed was um way 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 too many damn skills granted this is a problem i have with a, with a lot of with a lot of rpgs that came that came out in the 90s we're, we're, it was a it was a design issue at the time. I want to be clear here too. Sinless is its own RPG. Mm -hmm. It's an homage, and like I use Fritz Quadrata. Like I I I, I really am trying to resurrect the feel, but m mechanically it's a it's a different game. It, it's yeah. inspired by, but fundamentally different than Shadowrun. It plays differently. It has a different focus. I just don't want anybody listening to get confused. You should, if you like Shadowrun, it's not going to replace it. You should definitely yeah. check it out. I, I do want to get back to what you were saying, though. You, you said um, in, in Shadowrun, one of your frustrations was a long list of skills. Sinless mm -hmm. has a, is a capped list of skills, and they all have a strict mechanical purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, that that is 
the big the big reason that I'm the big reason that I'm bringing up Shadowrun was to kind kind of get a feel for what some of the things that frustrated you that you wanted to addr- that you wanted to address with well, it, um, it, it, sinless. It, it, I can I can definitely address that question just straightforward. Like first thing is that there's three separate games happening when you run Shadowrun, right? The Astro game, the Matrix game, and the tabletop game. And if you're running a game that's an extremely challenging thing to do, even if you can do it well, and it requires a lot of hijinks, a lot of, you know, um, trying to make... And they tried to address it in later editions, right? Like, they they tried to make the decker more useful. But I had the advantage of being able to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. So all three of those realms, the augmented reality realm, the magical realm they all take place in the same game space. There's no separate game that anybody else is playing. And whether you can interact with those realms has to do with whether you take Astral Senses or install AR node. You know, it's two simple options in character creation that allow you to affect and interact with those worlds. So nobody's kept out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the huge things, just, just the full play. The second thing is that the rules were written by somebody, it feels to me, in a white room, conceptualizing how rules should be. I don't play games that way. I play games like at a table. And so what matters to me is how it works in play. Like, I don't have time when I'm running a combat to try and figure out how Shadowrun wants me to handle barrier destruction. I know it's very complicated, and I know I have a sheet over there that tells me how I can do it. And I, I just... What the question is for me is, during play, is the barrier stopping the bullets? Can somebody destroy that barrier? And so I've come up with systems that allow you to answer those questions without losing any of the fidelity of the in-character upgrades or modifications or cyber cyber tectronic implants or biogenetic enhancements. Like, all that crunchiness is there, but it's resolved in play in an easy, in 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 a way that's focused, on allowing the, the referee to understand what's happening and quickly resolve complicated questions so we can get back to focusing on what's important, important which is what choices the players are making during the combat. Mm-hmm. And so it's focused on playing the game at the table. And so I don't know if that's something people like. Like, there's different kinds of RPG content fires. Like, uh, some buy because they like the writing and the art and the metal plot, right? I buy because I have five scheduled games a week. And I want to play. And that's a different type of game that's written for that type of game. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, And this is a type of game that that you can... uh, once you have the basics down, it doesn't take a whole lot to explain it to anybody. It's not super complicated at the table, and it has a real consistent flow. My models for the flow of battle were Warhammer and Warhammer 40k miniature mm-hmm. combat, right? Because it's it's a similar cadence, right? Whereas Shadowrun has uh, roll the hit, roll the dodge, add your weapon damage, soak and armor. Right, mm-hmm. uh, Warhammer is very similar in that it has attack, saves, and then um, uh, wound. immunity, whatever. Yeah, like armor, and you get you get five up or whatever. So it's got a similar flow of play to that style of tactical engagement. And then there's the domain game. Like half of Sinless is the domain game where players acquire assets, which are things like you know, clown biker gang and dream advertisement manager and, you know, mind control technician and, you know, like uh, auto specialist or bomb expert or sniper. And then they can use those assets in both the operations and the domain game to take over resources and the resources give them benefits. Um, And what happens in play is, is they do a job and they immediately want to go into the sector phase and then finish the sector phase and they want to take their new toys and money and tools and do another job and so it's it's got this real exciting uh consistent sort of back and forth style play that people seem to be really hyped for um uh, the response from my playtest group which is pretty mad on most of my ideas i gotta tell you has been super positive they're really enjoying it i have one player who poo-pooed it because it had magic you know he was one of those cyberpunk no magic people and he's into it now he's built some amps which, are, which is a physical adept for those who played Shadowrun. It's people who 
have intrinsic magical power. Uh, all the classics are there um, that you would expect, Deckers, Riggers, Mages, Street Ronin, all that stuff. But um, we also have like uplifted animals. It's a, it's a future in 2090 from today. So like we, it, it, wireless is assumed, right? Mm -hmm. We have uplifted animals and synthetic like life forms. And that's what I was talking about, you know, uh, earlier is that uh, it, like uplifted animals and synthetic life forms have different rights than human beings, you know, the green or the blighted or the human. We're all human. Um, and the game sort of like is, it examines that in, in, you know, like Star Wars says the same thing, right? Like it's droid slavery everywhere. It's mm -hmm. a little cyberpunk. I don't know if people realize this. Yeah. And uh, Sinless is a game that really explores that. Like droids, synth synths, they don't have any rights. None whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So like that's rough on a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so are you going to take advantage of that? Or are you going to like change that? is an option you know like you can do whatever you want it's fun mm -hmm. and maybe i'm maybe i misread this but it seemed but given the depiction of the of the um of kind of kind of the sector map as well as the sector tracker sheet would it be fair of me to say that the look that the location in which the campaign takes place has as much character as everything else yeah, that's the, the sector map is a secret tool that we'll find useful later. Like I, I it's designed to help the deal. You're running mm -hmm. the game, right? So what the sector map does is it allows you to sort of very simply track player activity, and from the choices they make and what's happening, it will sort of naturalistically lead you into what other kinds of things are going to be happening. You, the, the sector is dynamic, right? The players change it, they take resources over, They uh, there's a fallout phase in which consequences happen. We answer a lot of the pinch points in traditional RPGs in that there's an expectation that there's a path forward from a player getting targeted by assassination and how they resolve that mechanically so you don't have to like figure it out and what happens if the players lose a car chase like there's answers for those things in there that are that are traditional problems in a in in cyberpunk style heist style mercenary type game mm -hmm. um it, i'm sorry yeah. i feel like i, I don't want to I don't want to ramble. I'm very <laughs> excited about the project. Yeah. Uh, and so are the people who read it. Like, you know, it, it's not taking anything away from anybody. Um, and I've got some really excited, excited back. I mean, we've got, we've got enough. Yeah. There's like 700 backers. We're, we're, we're heading to 18K or we're at 18K. Like it, it's a success as it is. It's just, if you're interested in it, we do have some exclusive content. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where I have to get to one of my elephants in the room when it comes to when it comes to handling when it comes to handling cyberpunk. There, there have been I have been privy for better and for worse to all manner of debate regarding how regarding how to make um, hacking sequences more vi more viable in play so that people aren't just picking up their phones. Yeah, you know, sinless. Like I said, there the hacker is playing the exact same game as everyone else. There's no mm -hmm. separate game. So they have they have a default slate of options with a deck, and decks are just for hackers. A deck is like a, a wrist mounted holographic projector that like a cook would use it in his kitchen, or like an artist would use their deck to do art. It's 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 like a universal tool that the decker has a deck whose job is is to take control of other decks and other systems, right? So in play they have a default suite of abilities they can use. They can mm -hmm. you know uh, disable devices, take over devices, turn things on, turn things off. But if they have access to a network access node um, which is just a spot on the map, and they can get within range of that. They can uh, hack that and extend a radius of influence from that. On the same map, the Ronin are fighting on and the mages are casting spells on. They're just doing that on their turn. And within that radius, 
um, they have a special suite of software that allows them to do very powerful things. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about on the Discord, somebody who was running a game last night, and their decker brute force hacked uh, a network access node to get a bunch of influence and then started using an electrical attack, a lightning bolt people within it, but it sent the alert through the roof and there was a lot of response. Like it's it's definitely something that is integral to the play of the game at the table, the same game everyone else is playing. Mm. And they don't lose their utility in a car chase. You know, Decker's being able to tell what the route ahead is. We have a um, a car chase game inspired by Thunder Road. <laughs> That's an 80s throwback. It mm -hmm. was a car race game where when you reached the end of the board, you picked up the back of the board and you put the front on and anybody in the back got lost, right? <laughs> so that was a fun, you know, I'm eight or nine. I love this stuff. So I wanted to get that. I'm a big fan of Car Wars. So I wanted to have that feel in it. So we've got like a, a board and a mechanic and a procedure for handling like fun car chases because Ronin is one of my favorite films and I didn't want to make a game set in a cyberpunk world where you couldn't have a car chase like you had in Ronin and so we have lots of like there's a there's a whole section devoted to it and it's really a chance for riggers to shine which you know they don't get as much I think in a traditional game mm -hmm. I, I I think that it, it really um, is a fun aspect of it for sure yeah. yeah i don't even remember the original question i'm sorry i'm just again very yeah. you were asking about deckers being integrated into the game yeah it seems from the play tests and from the people playing that it has been a non-issue because they are playing on the same board mm -hmm. but in, if an ar like response drone comes in anybody can shoot the ar response drone as long as they can see it right like it's not separate to the decker it's anybody who has access to augmented reality can affect things in augmented reality and the same thing with astral sense yeah now speaking speaking of speaking of magic um mm -hmm. i'm cu i'm curious how you i'm curious how you're going to be having magic magic work obviously some obviously some did the do Think do things like spell drain. Some have it as you're using a, you're using a specific resource. Um, yeah, where do you played, fit into that equation? If you played Shadowrun three. Yeah, um, it'll take you zero seconds for you to come up to speed on the magic system. We have it was important because of the inspiration that we have all the we have amps which are physical adapt and we have shamans who form relationships with spirits and we have. Um, you know, mages and archmages who either have a specific focus school or can learn all the spells. And that was important, first of all, because it's an homage to Shadowrun, so it needs all those categories, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, secondly, the, the, the magic system in, like, when you think about Shadowrun Theory Show, what's a spirit do? It just kind of does what you need it to do. It's got a force and it's got some stats. It synthesizes a lot more creative like there's a spell in the shadow darkness school that opens up a gate to the plane of shadow and says you know and nobody has really gone there and knows what's in there mm -hmm. you know like like there's <laughs> there's um shamans don't form relationships with generic spirits they have a uh, spirit sphere spiral where they develop their relationships within a certain focus of spirits like elemental or digital or um, various other options, and so it allows them to kind of act like a jack of all trades with a suite of special tricks to spirits that they bound or have relationships with. But it's much more unique and interesting, um, mm -hmm. specifically to create uh, more entertaining play. You know, more yeah. options, more. You know, like like I I published a game called Perdition, and one of the thesis points for that game is that the setting is is dealt out by the mechanics mm -hmm. and i i that's one of my design principles you know i want the mechanics to kind of define the setting i think that's what they're useful for otherwise you should just be using generic mechanics in your own setting right yeah. and so there's tons of interesting options for mages and casting spells and when you cast a spell you have to soak the drain that it causes like mm -hmm. it's not it's not going to be unfamiliar but we eliminated like I eliminated all the the issues, the the complications with magic. You can see a spirit, shoot it; it'll get hurt. If you can, you know, um, it, 
there's no grounding or concerns about where spells go or what you have to look at to target. I just wanted people focused on playing. Mm -hmm. I agree that there's something lost there for not having it, but I don't think that that's the kind of thing I'm going for in my Shadowrun game. I, I kind of, in a four-hour session, they'll complete three or four sector turns and two or four operations. Right, like yeah. they want to go, go, go. They want to do them and be successful and move on. So it's 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 a pretty radically different style of play, mm -hmm. which doesn't lend itself into trying to figure out whether you can ground a spell or whether spirit is tethered. It's just, you know, I I looked at what I thought would be fun for people playing the game to do, and I tried to include as much of that as possible, and yeah. not include the parts that weren't fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it any better. I, <laughs> I may not have done well, but most people who back it, they look at it and they immediately back to a higher level. Yeah, you know, you can look at it for a dollar, but I'm not getting people backing for a dollar and then leaving. Like they back for a dollar and they're like, "I like this," and you can see it; it's written. It's not hypothetical. You just back the Kickstarter. You can read all the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll just read them, right? They'll yeah. look at them, please. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the now the other now um. Given that we're de given that we're dealing with um, cybernetics in in some form, um, aside from mo aside from monetary and po and possibly um, x and possibly XP or th or its equivalent, um, what is the main cost of implanting c cybernetics? Well, I, uh, so um, it's tied in with our magic system, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two opposite ends of the pole. Uh, when you're carrying metal or electronics as a piece of gear, it interferes with your ability to use magic. Not severely. Um, most of my mages are not afraid of getting, you know, a comm link, but there are magical options for various other implants. But mostly it's just price. There's no limit. Like, you can, you can cyber yourself up. I'm cool with that. I, I don't have anything like cyber zombies or anything. Yeah. Uh, you can cyber yourself to the point where you're unable to manipulate magic, but other than that, there's in the price, you know, there's no, you can't obviously like replace your bones and then replace your arm and still get the benefit for the bone replacement. Mm -hmm. Like, like you know, you can't you can't replace a part twice and get both benefits, but it's it's logical, you know. Um, there's cybertectronic implants and mm -hmm. biogenetic enhancements. So you can go either way. Mm -hmm. uh, biogenetics don't affect magic at all, but they're capped by your body. You know, your body, your body attribute. If you, if you have too many, there's an interesting table in the back of the document about what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't know if you've read any of the entries, um, but it can get pretty pretty weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So you might have somebody who wants to explore that little little uh, niche of gameplay. And. Oh. Not having a equivalent to to cyber zombies or or cyber psychos make makes for makes for interesting opportunities because you have a whole generation of people whose introduction to cyberpunk was Ghost in the Shell and yeah. sub and subsequently what the introduction entails um, someone going full cyborg a la Major Kusanagi, mm -hmm. but. I've had I've had plenty of cases where somebody gets in and want and wants to do that kind of thing, even in even in a advanced game, but yeah. because of the because of the whole risk of of going cyber zombie, um, they can't. Yeah, your main holdup in Sinless is cash. Uh, my players are poor and they work really hard, so I don't know. They're always they always seem to be running out of money. I I imagine if you play long enough, you will certainly get to an area where you can have as much cash as you want. And then the issue becomes, do you have access to cyber clinic? And what kind of cyberware do they have? Because you can't do anything in the game if you don't have access to a resource that provides. So th there's limitations that way. But if somebody wants to cyber themselves up using millions and millions of dollars, I think that's cool. I don't think it, it's not going to break anything. Mm -hmm. And granted, with, granted with thumb. Um... With some, with with someone like Kusanagi, the the full the full cyberization is government property. <laughs> so yeah, well yeah, and, and we have we have a corporate court which is assumed a new world government, and they 
like whoever owns the territory or the country that they're in, they make all the rules. Mm -hmm. So you have a very balkanized world and you can have whatever kind of like for an adventure for your players to go on, you can have whatever kind of cities and setups you want to explore whatever kind of themes you want. Um, the, the, the full cybernetic thing, there's no consciousness transfer in Synthless. Um, mm -hmm. It's assumed to be impossible with future technology. Synth intelligence, synthetic intelligence is uh, completely different. They use a positronic brain, you know, as mm -hmm. well. And uh, it's assumed that through plasma transfer, the cellular plasma transfer, consciousness is emergent. But they work fundamentally differently than human intelligence. So you can't really replace your brain. So that's the limitation. You know, your your brain, um, you can cyber all around it, though. Mm -hmm. And the big, the big reason I bring that up is when you, when I look at a lot of a lot of a lot of um, cybernetic rep, cybernetics representatives throughout um, throughout media, it's in a lot of cases, it's very extensive. Um, if I had to use a recent example, consider Adam Jensen in the in um, Human Revolution, in Deus Ex: Human Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, or if I have to go with something a bit more old school, let's consider let's consider <laughs> let's consider Murphy, aka RoboCop, mm. and how and how the only thing that was really that was really kept was hit was hit was his brain. Yeah. Although, as a bit of an aside, the RoboCop suit was absolute hell for Peter Weller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, I, I think RoboCop's probably one of the best movies ever. It's definitely in my top ten. I, I don't think that is... I don't think that is true or relevant to the way the brain actually works. Mm -hmm. we, we, we install... There's people who have cybernetically installed extra fingers, and their brain adapts to work those extra fingers in days if not sooner there's no dehumanization the brain is literally a tool that figures out how to adapt to what it can deal with right like like that's not going to happen they're just going to become extensions of ourselves like computers or cars our brain extends itself into the car you can talk to any professional car racer they'll tell you this they can feel the car and it's sending signals to their body. If they were cybernetically attached to the car, that's not going to make them go crazy or be less human. It's just going to be more efficient. I, so, like, I'm creating a vision of the future that I think is uh, realistic to where we are now and where we're going to be. And part of that is that humans are extremely adaptive to cybernetic technology and that it'll be, it's not going to cause any problems. Like, they, like I, I think you just adapt to it. I mean, it would suck not to have sensation, right? Like in RoboCop or whatever. But that's like an emotional issue. That's mm -hmm. not inherent to the idea of replacing cybernetics. Somebody who's willing to do that isn't going to experience the same distress. Yeah. And then once you get all cybered up, you can go and shoot somebody in the dick and it makes it all okay, right? Now, <laughs> speaking of shit... <laughs> speaking... <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh... The reason I the re, for what it's worth the reason I say it was hell for for Weller as the suit actor is two things. One, originally he was originally he was being trained in mime, uh, which which is hilarious in and of itself. Two, the suit the suit weighed about eighty five pounds. I can imagine. And three, even though the film is set in Detroit, they were filming in Dallas because Dallas was on that futurism kick in the eighties. So you're so you're in you're in a heavy thing where you're moving slow in the hot Texas sun. Mm -hmm. um, like he to the it, at one point it got bad enough that he was lo he was losing weight every day. Yeah, I don't think you see a lot of people out in Phoenix wearing chrome in 2090. No, they they probably go for the sin skin overlay. No, I don't see that. I don't see that many people wearing that much in um, Mordor. Yes, I know you said Phoenix. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's Mordor. <laughs> no, I, I I've been there. It's hot. It's mm -hmm. Stupid hot. Um, yeah, you know, like I I think um I don't think there's nothing that somebody taking too much cyber 
mean, the game is designed to handle that, right? Like, it's not going to break anything. Mm-hmm. Go, go nuts. Yeah. Go nuts. Have fun. Now I'm guess I'm guessing that when it comes to when it comes to weaponry, there's get, there's going to be a fair bit of customization within that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I um I mean I sh- I'm ex marine. I've shot guns. I've I've owned guns. I'm you know, but I'm not a gun guy. I'm not like a gun nut. But uh, I do like the idea of these future weapons, right? Demolition man stuff like that. Where are all the future guns? So we have that. We have. Uh, in order to make it easy, everything is contained on like the weapon card. They have these really great illustrations. And in addition to the default weapon, you can have um, a uh, a stock modification, uh, an underbarrel, an overbarrel mod, and then there's going to be um, uh, options for upgrading the weapons and different kinds of ammunition. Like I, people like cyberpunk games because it's fun to. To, to build like future warriors and shop and get all i mean so you could do that mm-hmm. let's do that yeah it's fun so yeah the the gun stuff is very fiddly and we worked on making it so that all the information you need is right there in front of you and doesn't require any sort of uh reference or other tools you don't have to look anything up to make combat flow as smoothly as possible yeah um I will. I will admit. I I do get a kick out of all of of all the stuff involved with the 450 tech urban that was on the Kickstarter page. Yeah, there's more in the document. Like like the, the illustrations on those guns are all going to be like that. And I'm going to do different brands with slight modifications for mm-hmm. the weapon. So you know, like like it's the fun part. Uh, and so I like draw. I, mean, I make those drawings. We have so many great illustrators. So me and, and J.E. Shields and, and Dire Quest, and they're so they're so talented. And I'm just really thankful that, um, that I have such a great team of people that work with me. And, and, and it's so good. It, it's old. It reminds me of old Holloway stuff, J.E. Shields' work. Mm-hmm. He's going to be doing the drones and uh, the vehicles. It's just so cool. The vehicles have the same amount of modifications, right? You can mount weapons on them. And there's even a procedure for bricolage. Like during a mission, you, you know, like the A-team, right? They take mm-hmm. the van in and they work on it. Like there's a way to do that in Simless, right? Because it might come up. You might need to like fix up your van and install the Alley Ram on it or whatever. So yeah. like that's a system and there's vehicle modification stuff. And, you know, it, it's not wasted because it ties right into... Like the car chase thing, which is a non-trivial part of the the gameplay loop, you know, and um, uh, it's just it, it, all that gear fun is is right there. I that you can't have for me and replicating the cyberpunk experience in my twenties. You can't you can't have that without the options to like enhance and cybertectronic your guy up to however you want them to be in the vehicles and the guns and all of it. I think that's mm-hmm. important. So I really focused on it. And, uh, cause it's, and that's, a, I'd say that sort of customization is going to be especially important since I get the feeling you're operating under the assumption that there's a variety of missions that a, par- that a party is going to be doing. Yeah, sometimes we, sometimes you know, it might be B and E. Sometimes it might be sabotage. Sometimes it might be um. Bur- sometimes it might be burglary. Sometimes it might be shoot everything sure. that moves. We we have an extensive list of those, and it's not isolated. One of the one of the problems I I've, I've found when I talk to people who run and play shower, what, what, how do you make a job? What do you what? How much does it cost? What are the prices? So we have. Um, I'm designing, I'm working on an extensive system that, that, that gives, uh, information and answers. Like we have guidelines for how much each job should pay and what's to be expected on it. There's already guidelines in there for the referee to create jobs. I'm just working on a tool to make it easier for them to generate them, Mm -hmm. uh, and not static jobs. Like part of the problem is, is it's like, Go A, do B, uh, trick C, right? That's not the type of table that I'm writing. Um, I'm I'm really trying to create a tool that will allow referees to quickly and dynamically create um, engaging uh, operation side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the gameplay loop fits really well around that. The players, once they get the job, they have an opportunity to do reconnaissance and uh, maybe even go and put... 
sabotage something in the area or stash guns or scout or figure out what kind of opposition it is and then they can make their plan you know it's it's got it's not leaving the players in the lurch for well how do we find a missing person well how do we know what's going on at the job site like like there's systems in place for handling all of that so that they get their questions answered then they make a plan it's really focused on maximizing that sort of time and that gameplay um and minimizing the amount of time you're not doing interesting stuff mm -hmm. so with all that with all that in mind you guys are sh as i understand it you guys are shooting for under two under 200 pages with the page count yeah so, somewhere just under 200 mm -hmm. that's the plan a hardcover a4 uh printed book if we hit 50k it'll be traditionally printed Mm -hmm. um, but right now, it's drive through RPG print on demand. Yeah. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a ballpark. Well, it's going to be out before Christmas. September is the release date, but it'll be available for sale. The The issues are um, problems with drive through RPGs printing and proof process. Mm -hmm. That All my Kickstarters have been on time except for the last one, and that's because we had a cover error. And it was there was some issue, and it was taking took six weeks for them to send it to the printer and get me a new proof. I that is out of my control. Mm -hmm. um, but the work was done, and the work will be done by September. You know, whatever remains. Yeah. Uh, so at the end of the year, for sure. Mm -hmm. I I'm playing it every week, so like it's not like we're gonna get it done because I need it as a reference. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm very motivated to finish it. Yeah. yeah. And. I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it to seeing how it develops and the the for, the forms of crazy that in, end up happening in mission in missions once the once the thing um once the thing hits it hits everybody. Yeah, that's the best part. Is like like so you're not you mentioned the adversarial role a little bit earlier, and you just create the job site. If the players miss something, they miss something. Like mm -hmm. that's where the surprises come in. Like you design it, and they ask questions. And, they can miss stuff, and if they miss stuff, that's what's going to surprise them. You don't have to engineer anything except the operation itself. You can just react in play and focus on the play. That was important to me um, because that that's what's important in play for a DM, right? Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And, um, yeah, we have plans for support. Um, we're talking with people about uh, TT, uh, the virtual tabletop modules. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have, hopefully, we're, we're working on getting an SRD up, um, and it's going to have an open license. Uh, I'm planning on modeling it after Mothership. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna support it moving forward. It's not just a one and done thing. I really like Cyberpunk. I really like Sinless. Mm -hmm. I really like the response to it. And so we're gonna see. Hopefully, uh, you know, the Kickstarter is already successful. We're gonna see additional content for it in the future. The first thing I'm really working on is a standout adventure. I mm -hmm. think is going to be the next thing. Um, I don't know that I'll kickstart it. I may just make it. Um, and then and then we'll see where we're at once we have. The core rulebook and a standout adventure. Mm -hmm. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Thank you for having me here. Um, it, it's awesome uh, for you to reach out and talk to me. I'm excited about my project, and you know, you're helping me mm -hmm. by talking to me about it. Uh, yep. If you're listening to this, Right before March, I believe it's uh, first is Friday. Is that right, mm -hmm. or is it the third? Um, March first is the when third. is Wednesday. Third. So if you're listening to this, is before March third. Go back sinless. You can help us get some more bonus content. And if mm -hmm. not, be sure and check it out. I'm still running the Discord. I'm not mm -hmm. going to stop playing it every week. We're mm -hmm. still working on it. So you know, uh, anytime. We'd love somebody to check it out and get new players. I think you know, big thing with RPGs is network effects. Mm -hmm. And I think I think we're past that point. I think we have enough. Like, there's people who are interested in playing this and who are playing it right now. So it's not like you're not going to be able to find a game ever. Um, so you should check it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, Mitch, mm -hmm. you can come on the Discord and play mm -hmm. with us. 
Mm-hmm. I'd be down with that. Yeah. You don't have to join us forever. We're going to have like an open table once the Kickstarter ends. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we finalize uh, all of the materials. We still have some assets left to be finalized. But once yeah. those are finalized, it's all the pieces, and then we can, we'll be playing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. But, and, and of course, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to, whether it's more of Sinless or any of your other projects, um, oh, yeah, I'll totally the door's that, always right? open. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I not to be crass and commercial. I'm just a guy. I'm trying mm-hmm. to make a living. I got a daughter. You know, like, I'll come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!